Corporation. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. Minnesota Public Radio, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Minnesota Public Radio. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. Well, thank you much, Karen and Chris. Nice talking with you. Karen, it's nice talking to you, too. How's the weather in Minnesota? <laughs> beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Karen, I'm curious. One of the things you're doing is studying how living in space affects humans. Describe how living in the space station for more than two months now has affected you physically. Well, if we didn't work out as much as we do, I think we would see a lot more changes. Um, I think uh, our, our bone density and our muscle mass is one of the main things we're worried about, but we exercise about two hours every single day. So uh, we're really mitigating that. Uh, other than that, you notice things like um, the calluses on your feet kind of start to go away because you don't need... You don't need, uh, you know, you're not walking around every day to form those calluses. And so things like that you notice. You know, I would think that two hours a day sounds exhausting, but with the weightlessness, it must be a different situation. Do you have to modify your equipment and your exercise? What we do for exercise, we have what's called a, an ad, um, resistive exercise device, which is kind of like lifting weights, and it actually uses the pull of a vacuum and cylinders. And we also have a treadmill that we bungee ourselves to to stay on the, on the floor as we run. And we also have a, a bicycle that we can use, and that we use those two for our cardiovascular health. There's the uh, physiological effects of being in space, but physically it's very tight quarters up there. It's got to be like having six people in a small tent on a camping trip. How is the interpersonal side of the equation for you? It's really good. Actually, it's not that. <laughs> it, isn't, it, it really isn't that crowded. The International Space Station is quite large. We have a number of modules. We have uh, the Russian segment and the United States segment, and we have, you know, 10 modules or so on the U.S. segment that are quite large, the size of a school bus or bigger. So it's very easy. We each have our own sleeping quarters. Um, you know, if you feel like you do need to get away from each other. And when we're working throughout the day, sometimes we're working in the same module, sometimes we're separated. So really, the privacy is good, and interpersonally, I think this, this is a great place to be. Now, you're doing a lot of studying, as I mentioned, about the space effects on humans. You're also investigating what caused water to leak into the helmet worn by your crewmate, uh, Luca Parmitano, during that spacewalk on July the 16th. Have you figured out anything yet? Well, uh, hopefully you'll let somebody from Maine to speak to you in Minnesota. I'm uh, glad to I'm glad to answer this question because I, I had the uh, fortune or misfortune to be out there with Luca. And um, right now, the engineers have have put together a really detailed troubleshooting plan that we're about halfway through executing. And I think the best way to answer it is we know what the problem wasn't. There were about five or six items that it could have been, and we've eliminated most of them. And we're down to the to uh, two or three really prime suspects. And we'll, we'll uh, with one or two more tests, we'll have a, uh, exactly identified the problem and make sure that we can if we can, we'll fix it in space, but we might have to bring that suit back to Earth and fix it there. And, uh, but most importantly, making sure that all the rest of the spacesuits in our inventory are safe for, for subsequent spacewalks. I know you all are getting ready for the arrival of a Japanese cargo ship. What's your responsibility when that ship arrives? The HTV, which is coming up next week, actually, uh, it is grappled by the, the Canadian robotic arm. And so Chris and I will actually be working together at the robotic workstation to use that arm to, to grapple the, uh, the vehicle as it comes in. It's going to it, uh, rendezvous automatically under its own systems. And it, when it gets to a certain distance away, we'll be in the cupola and we'll be um, able to uh, monitor the approach as it gets closer to space station and then reach out and grab it. And then uh, the controllers on the ground will actually use the robotic arm to install it to one of the um, hatches, the hatchways on the space station, and then we'll be able to go in and get all the goodies that are arriving. 
you know, you're doing a lot of work, uh, Karen and Chris, and of course the other crew members too. What do you all do to unwind? It's funny there it the week goes by and you you really realize there's not a lot of free time especially on the weekdays and by the time we finish our work day <clears throat> and uh, get done with our daily planning conference that we do with all the space centers around the world. We, uh, you know, then it's time for dinner and phone calls to family and that type of thing, and then the day is done. On the weekends, we have about half a day on Saturday where we have free time and then most of Sunday. And we all like to go and take pictures out of the window. We read, we just sit and chat with each other. Um, I brought some uh, projects to work on. I'm trying to do a little bit of sewing. Uh, I haven't done as much as I would like, but like I said, the free time just the time just goes so fast here. Well, Karen, your pictures are gorgeous on Twitter, by the way. Thank you. I'm I'm trying to show everybody who isn't as privileged as we are to be able to come here what it looks like from this vantage point. Like I said, we're so privileged to be able to come and and see the Earth and the, how beautiful it looks from here. And and since so few people get to do that, I think sharing and I try to get my pictures to look in a way so it looks like it does when we look and the the colors as vibrant as it as it is when we look out the window, and um, just try and share what we're seeing. Karen, have you finally gotten a chance to take a picture of your hometown of Vining, Minnesota, from space? I did a couple weeks ago, thanks to Chris. He knew I had been waiting to um, to get a picture of it, and every single time we passed over, it was very cloudy. And then one time I was working on, on a project, and he called over Intercom and said, Karen, it's clear in Minnesota. And so I went down to the cupola and, and got some pictures, and I think everybody in my hometown area really enjoyed it. Say, final question, do you both think you'll be ready to come home after about six months in space? I think six months is a, is a good amount of time. I think it's enough time. You kind of want to go home before you're, you're craving going home, I think. Um, but, of course, with our families at home, everybody, you know, I... I I, I'm going to be looking forward to going home. I hate leaving this place, um, but but I know I'll be looking forward to go home, going home in November. Karen and Chris, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the Minnesota Public Radio portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from the U.S. Navy. Station, this is U.S. Navy production. How do you hear me? I hear you loud and clear. It's great to be with uh, fellow service members today. Thank you, sir. From the early days to the present, the Navy has been an important contributor to America's efforts in space, both unmanned and manned. In fact, more astronauts have graduated from the Naval Academy than any other higher education institution. I'm Petty Officer Brandi Wills, and here in studio with me, I have Midshipman Second Class Lucas Papadakis, an aerospace engineering major at the Academy and a hopeful future astronaut. And live from the International Space Station is Commander Chris Cassidy, a Navy SEAL, to discuss the Navy's role in space and his own experiences. Thank you for joining us today, Commander Cassidy. Hey, my pleasure. It's great to be with you today. Sir, our first question is, why is space important to the Navy? Well, you know, um, obviously communication is vital to anything we do, from as simple things as our own relationships to uh, war to space. And, uh, and the space environment for the Navy is critical for our communications network, tracking our ships, um, responding to disasters or conflicts, and everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and having the ability to track and manage all of this infrastructure all around the world. It's actually really critical to, uh, to our warfighting capability, I think. How has your Navy service prepared you for being an astronaut? 
Well, you know, that's an interesting question. I think that um, to be successful as an astronaut, you need to have the ability to um, think operationally and do things while you're communicating on the radio, while you're, while you're processing multiple things. And that's what I've learned over my time, my few months here. And that was really instilled in me from my first days of stepping on to the uh, Naval Academy yard all the way through uh, being groomed as a, as a junior officer and mentored by some of the senior enlisted that I had the privilege to work with. And um, just really the fundamental things of what we need our, our Navy warfighters, our military warfighters to do, translates exactly to, uh, to life in space. It's an operational environment. We're doing things that we can get us hurt or hurt the equipment that we're working with. Neither one of those are good. And, uh, and it's that innate sense of how to do that, I think, is instilled in every one of us that uh, joins the service. Are there any similarities between the SEAL and the astronaut communities? Well, I'm asked that often, actually. And um, I think uh, at, at face value, it's very similar training pattern. Uh, in the SEAL teams, much like the rest of the Navy, on a typical pre-deployment workup, you go together with some basic unit level training. Um, and then as you get more proficient, you'll start integrating with other units until you prepare for your final exercises prior to deployment. And we have a very similar pattern here uh, in the training for space. At the beginning of being assigned to a space mission, you, you train up on individual systems, just you and an instructor learning the, uh, the wiring diagrams and how the system works. And then you build up to an integrated simulation environment where you're working with other crew members from other countries and on multiple systems at the same time. All in a, that culminates with some exams prior to launch, and we go on our mission. We're up here for six months, just like on a Navy deployment is typically six months. So that training pattern is very similar. Um, and then the other thing is the SEAL, my SEAL team life was much more uh, physical, uh, and we, we do exercise quite a bit up here on space. It's it's essential, but uh, I think I find I find myself. Um, uh, it's more of an academic environment in the, in, the, in the qualification process to be assigned to a, to a flight here at, at NASA. You mentioned the physical side, sir. What kind of physical training was required for the demands of living in orbit? Well, you know, it's interesting. We, we um, try to, we work out pretty regularly on the Earth, but it's a, everybody has busy schedules just like um, uh, everybody else uh, train, when we're training up for a mission. But when we get to space, it's, it's not just a matter of what our desire to work out, it's essential. We have to do it. If we did not exercise, our, our bones would think, oh, I, I have nothing to do. I can, I can relax. I can atrophy. I don't have to carry a load. And our bone density, density would constantly fall off, much like an elderly person with osteoporosis. And, and the only way to really combat that is um, resistive exercise, weightlifting type strength training on the large muscles, your legs, lower body, and back. And that's what we concentrate on. We do a lot of, um, of squats and deadlifts and that sort of thing to, to keep our, um, mostly our legs and our hips healthy. That's uh, absolutely critical. We also have a bike and a treadmill. And that, that we use as well, but that's just to maintain our cardiovascular health. The real true criticality is keeping our bones healthy. Why do you think the Naval Academy has produced more astronauts than any other higher education institution? Well, I think it's just a, um, a matter of numbers, maybe. If, it, if you look at a, the astronaut office, about half of the astronaut office uh, is military. It's, it, the numbers are a little bit different right now. We're sort of going through um, a transition period. But historically, the half, half the astronauts have been active duty military and half civilian. And uh, when, when you look at um, those military officers that, that come to, to the astronaut office, it's probably pretty pretty close. I mean, we might have the exact uh, the lead, if you will, over the Air Force, which is a good thing because I'll be coming home uh, in the first week in October and going to our homecoming where we beat Air Force. But that aside, um, the Air Force and the Navy probably have the, the two close 
uh, are really close in the number of astronauts we, we've produced. The Army has some too. The Coast Guard Academy has a, has an astronaut, uh, but it's just a matter of uh, of the sheer volume uh, that we have. What's next for you, sir? What's next for me? Well, um, what I like to say up here is the, the, the only important thing in the space station is what you're doing right at this time. Because any, anything else we can screw up and cause damage to the vehicle or, or worse to ourselves. So what's next for me is to make sure that I keep this place safe and running, uh, running ship shape until it's time for me to leave. After that, when I come home in, uh, in September, I will go through about a two-month rehabilitation period, get myself healthy, make sure uh, and finish, close out all the experiments that we have ongoing uh, on, on ourselves, and then do uh, a little bit of public relations things as I prepare for either a next, my next assignment as, as a space flyer, but probably I will just work in the astronaut office supporting other ongoing missions and my friends that are that have the privilege of coming up here beyond that in the the five five year time horizon it'd be great if i could come back to this to space but but uh, we'll leave that up to my bosses thank you for your time commander cassidy thank you very much uh mid midshipman pop but Papadakis, excuse me if I got your name wrong. It's uh, best of luck to you as you pursue your dreams, and to all of you out there, um, go Navy. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you, Minnesota Public Radio and the U.S. Navy. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. Copy that.